Good uh, technical talk. So announced this before. is intro talk. So. <laughs> That's okay. intro talk. So okay. Just get okay, so uh, yeah. I'm going to sit and uh, do this presentation. So is that fine? Okay. So so this talk is about, basically it talks about um, the basics of RL, some of the state of the art uh, that's been happening over the past couple of years. And then I'll, if there is time, I'm going to talk about something that we did uh, with a couple of interns uh, last summer. Okay, so so what's the outline? I'm going to discuss what is RL, uh, the recent advances, uh, how to design new and improved algorithms, and uh, and there were some threads about how can other areas in CS help, uh, particularly systems research, because deep learning has been quite successful thanks to uh, you know computer architecture uh, innovations. So similar things can happen also on in in, in RL domain. So the basics. I'm going to discuss first uh, what's what's the significance of uh, RL uh, uh, as as a toolkit. So RL goes by some other names in other areas, but the areas which it, it actually touches uh, range all the way from optimal control in engineering. Uh, it touches AI and machine learning. Uh, it touches neuroscience and psychology. It also touches economics and operations research. And, uh, and of course, many of these areas have very interesting applications. Uh, for example, control applications like uh, flying drones and autonomous, autonomous driving, uh, which seem to be more and more practical today, <laughs> uh, are driven by some of the innovations in RL and online learning. And, uh, and similarly, in operations research, inventory management, and so on. Um, uh, we, uh, we have tried to use some of the tools needed for RL in uh, transportation uh, research and resource allocation problems as well. And, and some of the recent advances made by DeepMind is in, is in playing games using uh, reinforcement learning research. So I guess this is just a picture uh, of, of the different applications. Uh, so what do we do with the application? Uh, Predominantly, people think of prediction models, uh, pl classifying or predicting uh, some some decision to take given 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 the input feature or input state. Uh, but think of uh, reinforcement learning, or uh, more uh, the uh, is 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 more in terms of if you had multiple predictions and you had to tie them together to take a more complicated action, then then it becomes a, then you can't just uh, get away with the simple prediction model. You want to do an optimization or or some. Uh, non-myopic planning, and that's where RL shines. OK, so let's get to uh, RL. Uh, so RL basically is trying to address uh, what is called the sequential decision-making problem, and it has a few ingredients. Uh, the ingredients are um, uh, we are given an environment uh, in which a uh, uh, agent is acting or is basically taking actions. These actions influence uh, the future uh, of, uh, of where the agent is or what the environment state is. And the agent gets feedback signal every time it takes an action. So based on this feedback signal, the agent has to uh, kind of maximize some notion of total reward. And RL provides some, some sound answers to this question. So you can do this, uh, you, once you set up this uh, uh, you know, setting uh, of an environment, an agent acting, and so on, you can have many uh, several formalisms to deal with this. But RL provides some of the uh, answers to how to maximize total reward in a principal way. So, so what is the environment? So, so the environment is basically seeing agent's action AT, and it generates an observation ST plus one and a reward uh, RT plus one. And subscript T is indexing uh, time, and so the current observation uh, uh, is ST and is called the uh, state. So, what happens in the future uh, typically depends on what happened in the past. But uh, uh, one of the simplifying assumptions, which uh, uh, which a lot of uh, um, a lot of applications make is that uh, the future is independent of the past given the present and you have seen this assumption in many other machine learning models it's called the marco assumption uh, so the conditional probability of uh, the next state given the current state is uh, independent of the previous um, uh, t minus 1 states and uh, we'll also assume everything is everything relevant to us taking an action and getting the feedback signal is uh, is observed in the sense there are variants where uh, which are called partially observed settings so where you only uh, let's say you, you you're let's say you're in the autonomous driving setting and we kind of press accelerator we may only get some partial observation rather than the full observation of the state okay for example partial observation can be just uh, 
the x coordinate or x coordinate of your uh, of, of 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 where you landed next rather than the x and y coordinate of where you landed next so such things we will not uh, will kind of gloss over here so the second ingredient is the agent so the agent is going to uh, uh, observe this next uh, this uh, next state and the reward uh, uh, and uh, these are not iid across time okay uh, agent's objective is, as I said in the first slide, its, uh, its objective is to maximize expected total future reward. So agent is act acting, uh, at, uh, agent took an action AT, it got the reward RT plus 1, agent took another action AT, AT plus 1, it got the reward RT plus 2 and so on. And so basically it's trying to figure out how to maximize uh, this objective which is, uh, okay, it is not mirrored, but uh, okay the objective is written as the expectation over all the, uh, all the, all the rewards. Uh, until, for example, infinity. Um, so gamma is a discount factor just to keep uh, the the infinite sum uh, um, bounded. And agents affect uh, agents actions uh, affect what it sees in the future. So if it takes a if it let's say it's a robot, it takes a left, and of course it'll it'll be in a in, in the stage space where it's looking at the left side of the room. Or if it takes a action right, maybe it's looking at a stage space which is right side of the room. So agents action influences what it sees in the future. It's very critical. And uh, and sometimes it's also better to trade off uh, current reward to gain uh, more uh, rewards in the future. So that's the notion of uh, non-myopicness. So instead of being greedy, uh, what is the best thing you can do at this given point of time? You may want to trade trade this off uh, across time. So 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 these are some of the features or some of the properties of the uh, agent. Uh, also, by the way, you can ask any questions. Uh, yes. So there is a, you are assuming there is a distribution over the rewards given a state, given a state or? Yeah, yeah, I'm, so I'm assuming, uh, so uh, yeah, given uh, given a state, uh, given an action, they can, there is a distribution on the rewards, yeah. And this is uh, invariant over time? Invariant over time, they, it can be variant over time, so, so it, yeah. Okay. So, so the whole framework uh, is about uh, trial and error based learning. So if the environment changes, since you're trying and uh, you know you're trying few things and learning few things, you can kind of adapt. A similar thing with online learning, right? You, you don't have to assume that uh, everything. Let's say if it's a, if you're in a bandage setting, you don't have to assume that the distributions on the uh, on the rewards, uh, sorry, on the arms are fixed. They can be moving. It can be a moving target. You will still learn, but of course the guarantees are given in terms of fixed uh, targets, right? But it's random. It's not random. Yes. Uh, it's random. It uh, is not adversarial. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe there are. Maybe there are variants which are adversarial. Actions of the agent. The action pays, right? The set of actions that an agent can do that also changes to the state. They depend on actions, sir. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, so I didn't characterize it fully. So, so agent's action, uh, set of valid actions AT, I mean, from which it's going to choose an AT at time T, it can depend on the state, clearly, right? So sometimes if you're if you're already at the boundary of the room, you can only move forward, backward, and, you know, maybe towards the left, you can't go to the right because you'll bump into the wall. So you're restricted, things like that, right? Okay, thank you. Um, and that does not mark I mean, there's uh, mark Markovian assumption yeah. means this function cannot be like a strict function of the previous states or something like that. Right? I mean, uh, Markovian assumption is just saying uh, how the transitions happen, right? Yeah. So, no, but if what we do you are mean? talking about distribution changing over time, but it, uh, okay, like, okay. you know, there's some kind of uh, I, I should not learn from past type of thing, but actually, you're learning from the past. I mean. There's some little bit of uh, Learning from the past is basically, since it's a trial and error framework, you, if you are in a certain state, you try different actions. Uh, maybe in historically, you tried a few actions. So mm -hmm. that kind of informs that hopefully what actions you need to take. Yeah. So that's but learning from like the past. Oh, I, so here I'm assuming fixed uh, unknown transition. So it's okay. fixed. So there's uh, learning okay. from the past okay. is, yeah, is informative. The problem would be yeah, yeah. So there could be variants where you cannot learn from the past if there is moving target, but still, uh, if if it's not too much of a moving target, maybe you can learn. So this is all in the stochastic, uh, you know, setting, non-adversarial setting. Is it clear? The setting is clear for the new. So let's actually, uh, you know, kind of uh, understand this from uh, from a game. Uh, you can probably vaguely see this. So uh, so this is a game called Breakout from Atari. Uh, and uh, 
And so what's happening is basically you need to balance a ball. So you can see the, so there's a particular pixel which is moving around, that's a ball. And, uh, and so you as an agent, you only have control which is to move this uh, paddle left or right. Okay, left, right, maybe stay there. Maybe left two steps, right two steps. So, uh, so that depends. Uh, so that's your action. Uh, the environment is uh, this in this simulator, which is basically uh, showing you know. What, so if if you move the paddle uh, to a certain level and maybe the ball hit your paddle, then what's going to be the next uh, location of the ball? Sometimes, irrespective of action, the ball moves. So that is also change of state. Um, uh, and the reward is basically uh, uh, displayed at the top. So every time I think you break, you hit a brick, uh, you get an increment. Uh, a counter is uh, incremented there, so that's the reward. So, so here, the agent is that slide. Yes, so the agent is uh, taking. So AT in our notation is going to be the left right actions. Okay. So at any given, so think of this as like a snapshot at every time. Mm -hmm. So at every snapshot, what am I doing? I'm moving the paddle left, moving the paddle right. Okay. Yeah. And, and the environment means the uh, position of the ball. So ST uh, in our notation is going to be uh, the current uh, position of the ball, what action did we take and did the position of the ball change or did bricks break or what happened. So so most interesting thing is, so when the, uh, maybe the ball is somewhere over here, you already moved here. Okay, so where did the position of the ball go? It Maybe it's, if it's far away, it still is going to move in, in its, uh, you know, uh, in its trajectory and nothing's going to happen. But so each position of the ball is ST. Yeah, just think of the each screenshot as the ST, from which you can infer the position of the ball and how many bricks you broke and so on. And that's what actually happens in this uh, particular, uh, the, the agent. So what you are supposed to do is figure out how to make this actions AT. So whatever algorithms, programs you want to write, or RL agents in this case, they are supposed to just move, uh, you know, figure out, kind of, kind of direct how the paddle should move. So, so uh, are you assuming that the environment uh, behavior is similar? Uh, fixed. So in this case, actually, uh, the environment is not stochastic, uh, right? It's a corner case. I mean, it's a special case. Uh, yeah, it's not stochastic. Uh, what's your question? Uh, yeah, so that so uh, if it touches uh, some the blue brick yeah. in some in, in a particular angle, yes, so yes. the reflection will be always same. I think this one is based on the physics, so yeah, yeah. reflection physics and so on. So, but this means uh, for this the environment is fixed. So it can be the case that the environment is not fixed. That is the behavior of the environment is yeah. changing. Yeah. Yeah. So what? So a variation or a stochastic version. This could be it can after the ball goes up, maybe it's randomly pushed to left or right or something. So that would be a stochastic environment, right? Um, so in this case, it's not. Uh, yeah. Every time it takes bricks, the uh, reward counter is increasing. So. It's a, it's a, I guess a deterministic function of the state mm -hmm. in this case. So those are. So what I'm actually showing is a different screenshot here. Actually, the this particular RL agent or whatever we pro, you know, somebody programmed is actually doing something very interesting. It's figuring out uh, that the best strategy is to kind of uh, kill the bricks or break the bricks at the edges and then make the ball bounce around at the top. So it's it's a strategy which is not trivial. Uh, figure out yeah okay so 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 there are three types of agents so what what are we supposed to do we need to kind of describe uh, what at needs to be at every round t right so the three types of agents uh, some agents just track uh, what to do in a given state so so they have a they basically deal with something called the policy function which is a map from every state to an action okay which are which are valid actions in that state some other agents uh, track something called value, uh, and it is a, it is a number that you associate with each state. Uh, it's going to tell you how good uh, that state is. So, uh, so what is meant by goodness of the state? If I am in that state, maybe I can do something decent and get a lot of high score or, or to, you know maximize my total reward. That's what it is. And uh, and let's say we fix a policy pi, then the number that I can attach the attach to the state is going to be v pi of s. Uh, which is just going to be the expectation of the total rewards I will collect, starting from state uh, ST as S and executing policy pi. Right. So, 
uh, there's another variant of the value function. So value is just a you know a number that I as I said I'm I'm going to attach to the state. I can also attach a number to a state and an action pair. So that's going to be the Q value function. And it's also basically saying I'm in the state as I'm going to take action and from uh, once I take that action I'm going to for all future points I'm going to take uh, actions according to let's say a policy pi. Then what is the total reward I'm going to collect? It's like a measure of goodness of the state or measure of goodness of the state and action. Um, yeah. How are you selecting pi? So so that's what we need to figure out. If if so that's what the agents are going to do. So either their internal object is going to be they're going to start with a pi and then kind of increase pi's. They're going to move in the space of policies, or they're going to track uh, value functions and going to move in the space of value value functions. But indirectly they are going to kind of modify pi's because they're related, right? Whether you track, whether if you improve value function values, you know, basically you need to keep changing pi's. Your objective is to find a good policy, as in best actions to take in each state. So, so we will figure, we'll come back to how we're gonna uh, improve pi's, uh, for example, later. And then there is the third family of agents, which just tries to tri do trial and error and figure out how the environment, de you know, is, is how the environment uh, uh, kind of uh, works. So the environment works by state transitions and rewards, right? So if I'm in state S, uh, which is uh, the second equation from the last, uh, if I'm in state S and I take an action uh, A, then I'm going to navigate to another state S prime with some probability. So that's what the environment is actually doing. Of course, it can be a deterministic transition, it can be a stochastic transition, but if I, through trial and error, kind of can estimate that this is, you know, if I if I'm in state S and I take action A, maybe it's 50 percent of the time I go to uh, state S prime one, 50 percent of the time I go to S prime two. Knowing that information is what this third type of agent can do, like uh, kind of track that information and learn that information. Now, if once you learn uh, the dynamics of the environment, you can actually solve uh, uh, solve for pi's and so on uh, later. So so they are all related. It's just a question of what representation does an agent, uh, you know, like to have. So they're just I've broadly characterized into three families. Okay. Uh, so, for the policy base, uh, does it can can the agent also decide what actions to choose based on the reward accumulated so far, or is that included in the state information? Uh, no, no, no. So I just said uh, the main object that it tracks is policies, but of course it's gonna look at rewards uh, that it collected so far in history. So, so since it's a trial and error framework, you have to kind of look at what all you've done in the past, and that has to inform what policy or what is the best policy you think you're gonna execute from at this point or this point onwards. So. I just said that these these are the main objects uh, that the agents track. Of course, uh, the, tr the rewards that it sees are going to uh, maybe additional variables, for example. So it could be part of the state itself. Yeah, it can be part of the state or it can be additional variables. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, because I think the other two uh, categories, but there was no reward in the first one. Okay. Oh, I just said, okay, I just defined what a policy was in the first one. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, so again, uh, so let's say whatever objects, you know, I said three objects it can maintain, either it can maintain policies, it can maintain value functions, it can maintain uh, reverse engineer the dynamics of the environment, you know, it can do what one of these three things. Uh, but what is the strategy that the agent is going to expo, ex, uh, you know, what is the strategy by which the agent is going to uh, try to figure out how to maximize its total reward is going to be, as I said, it's a trial and error framework. So sometimes you need to explore and hopefully sometimes you need to exploit to actually maximize the uh, total reward collected. So so when I, may, when I, when I say explore, uh, you basically have to obtain information. If you may be in some states, you don't know what's the value of that state. You don't know uh, if I take action A, whether I'm going to die or <laughs> not die and so on. So you need to explore and exploit. So that, uh, that trade-off is going to be there. And in terms of optimization, there are a couple of things uh, uh, you can do. One is uh, uh, one is what we call prediction, where you just want to evaluate the performance of a policy. So somebody even told you, okay, execute this policy. Even to figure out that uh, how good that policy is, you still need to do some trial and error. Like for example, just execute the policy for a few rounds and see how 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 what is the uh, you know some measure of uh, niceness or you know goodness of that policy, right? So that's the prediction part. And the control part is okay. You know, you want to find the best policy, and so uh, uh, so that's the optimization part. And uh, finding the best policy, uh, uh, you can just uh, there are 
to find the best policy there are multiple methods uh, just uh, similar to the main objects that were being tracked in the previous slide so if it's a policy based method then you're going to compute uh, pi star uh, which is this this policy is going to uh, achieve the maximum total reward actually or maximum future reward um, the second one is going to be value based where since it's tracking value functions it's going to maximize uh, this this value function uh, and then uh, you know there will be a policy corresponding to that maximal value function and so it's, that's the policy that you want to execute and then model based is uh, if you actually learn the model then you just solve then it kind of maps to a markov decision process and then you there is an offline way of uh, for example solving the mdp yeah. so you can zoom the p and the uh, r rewards so yeah. all these three coincide right? yeah if you know p and r you just do model based which is basically called planning in the ai and other literature i guess or literature is just an mdp right uh, mdp specification is the state action uh, transition probabilities rewards and maybe even discount factor and given that you can just uh, solve for um, best policy yeah so yeah so whether whether you so for example by solving mdp you may not maybe you need to use uh, value functions as uh, underlying representations and then do some op do some uh, operations on them or you can directly maybe navigate in the policy space jumping from a policy to policy uh, which is what policy iteration does <laughs> i'm saying yeah. the, if you think of the organization as a black box and if you nuke p and r then what yeah. comes out of it is the same the yes 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 yeah yeah so actually that's a interesting question so so for some <laughs> nice assumptions uh, so q star is uh, unique and it follows from something called the bellman optimality equation uh, it exists and it's unique and uh, whereas pi need not be unique by the way pi star cannot be unique but q is going to be unique um, mm -hmm. uh, okay so the conditions like you know, how how realistic are these conditions no no i mean so the simplest yeah. setting is uh, infinite horizon discounted um, MDP style setting, so okay. for that Q style is unique. Um, so it's a it's a quite general set of uh, environments. Yeah. yeah. So let's. Uh, so basically, I just wanted to introduce that. Okay, there are. What is the basic uh, problem here? Sequential decision making, trial and error framework, uh, different types of agents. And so we now we're going to look at one particular agent which is quite popular, um, uh, which maybe is a go-to agent if you if you want to start uh, with a basic agent for uh, controlling actions to maximize total reward. Um, so this agent is uh, uh, based on the algorithm. Uh, so uh, this agent or this algorithm is called Q learning. So so this is as you know, it's as in the name, it's is going to maintain Q, which is going to be the state action value function. Okay. So let's assume. Uh, we have uh, we have we want to uh, track value functions. So so value function is a function of the state and the action. So let's say it's a, it's basically a matrix uh, with uh, rows being states and uh, columns being actions. So basically you just want to fill in uh, numbers in this matrix, which is going to ascribe a score of if you are in this state and if you are in this action, how valuable uh, do you think this pair is, basically. Okay. And so this Q learning algorithm uh, is going to act iteratively uh, in rounds. It's going to take action 80, uh, and uh, it's going to take action 80 uniformly at random with probability epsilon, and it's going to take an action uh, based on the current uh, table, this Q matrix, uh, with probability 1 minus epsilon. Okay? And this is to uh, talk about gathering information versus exploiting known information. Known information is captured in the Q matrix. Uh, and you know information that you don't know is that's what you want to gather. So you are you're trying out an action uniformly at random. Uh, so that's the uh, explore thing. And uh, whatever you do, once you take an action, you get a reward R T, uh, or sorry, in this case R T plus one. So I have indexed. Uh, if you are in state S T and you take action A T, you will get a reward R T plus one. So that's just a convention. Um, and so once you get a reward R T plus one, uh, you're gonna just update that particular entry. Uh, uh, so this is what this is the number you that you get. You just update that entry uh, using this update equation. It's just a, um, I guess, weighted uh, uh, moving average. Um, so for example, you can just see that it's basically if you take uh, uh, so this term is the same as this term. So basically, it's one minus alpha t times uh, some previous. This is the previous number that you had, and alpha t times some new number, basically. And the new number doesn't just depend on the reward that you saw. Uh, 
right now, but you also kind of uh, uh, take a number which you already had before, let's say, at a different location, because ST plus one is the next thing. So, so we'll not go into the details of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can we just uh, the second part, like how it's uh, taking the argument? So, after exploring, uh, how the exploit steps is working? Oh no no so. So in any round T, either you take an action AT uniformly at random. So so at let's say I'm at this state, uh, okay. I can take left, right, forward, backward, right. So those are the four actions. I can take one of those four actions with probability epsilon, or I can take an action uh, because I'm maintaining the stable uh, at at row ST. Uh, I'll have four numbers associated with each of the actions. Whichever number is higher, uh, I'm going to take the index. You know, I'm going to use that action. Oh, okay. okay. Use the knowledge actually. Yeah, use the knowledge with 1 minus epsilon probability and don't use the knowledge with probability epsilon. And whatever you do, you're going to hmm. collect some rewards, so you just update uh, that that score in that uh, entry of that table uh, with the new number. So this being negative means what? So what being when will this be negative? So, uh, the value, the after the update, huh. I mean, when, will you, when will the value go down? Uh, when will the value go down? So, so when that term is negative, right? Uh, so it's just a moving average, right? So let's say alpha is some value between zero to one. Right. Then it's so let's say this number is x. Uh, so one minus alpha times x. Uh, no, so it took it was q s t a t before. So now we yeah. are adding something. Yeah. And if that is negative, then the value of the state itself goes down. So I'm oh yeah, yeah, this number, that right. number. Yeah. So what what does it mean to say this is so, so you took, you got this reward, but then from that uh, state onwards, so it's it's the value from that state onwards is quite bad. So then this number is going to be small, right? This sum can be probably small. So you're uh, transitioning into a state where the value has decreased from the current. So, for example, I'm at the edge of a cliff. <laughs> I took a, you know, left action. It just fell down. So from that state onwards, I'm, I will have probably no chance of doing anything decent forever because Q was, you remember Q was defin defined as the expectation over RT plus 1 plus RT plus 2 plus, you know, let's say infinite sum. And so this number is going to be very low and maybe immediate reward is also. So in fact that would be the next action that you take, right? So max A in A, Q S T plus 1 A. That would be your yeah. next action, right? A T uh, plus no, 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 that's not the next action. That's just, this is just used for updating my current Thing. So in the next round again, I'm gonna wherever. So at S T plus one, this max a uh, that would be it, right? Because you're updating will be with one minus epsilon probability, but with, but with epsilon probability, I may take a different ah, okay. Actually, this ingredient is important, and this ingredient is important, and this update is really you know uh, has a few tricks to understand why this makes sense. Uh, and actually, with this exploration and this update, you can show that uh, uh, you can show a strong uh, Convergence and asymptotic convergence. Uh, so the prob so you so the limit of this estimator Q uh, is equal to Q star with probability one that you can show. I mean somebody showed <laughs> long time ago. Uh, okay. So but for, just for a real problem, yeah. real life problem. So here you are saying uh, limit t tends to infinity. But for real life uh, problem, this you don't need. Uh, this is analysis, right? I mean, yeah, this yeah. is the algorithm. Just use the algorithm. Yeah, but uh, the thing is that for uh, how much iteration I need to do uh, to yes. get to a stable. So there are actually. So this is just uh, asymptotic results. So there are yeah. finite, uh, finite step results as well. So in t rounds, how far is uh, q? This is an estimator, right? How far is q uh, close from q star? Close. Yeah. How close is q from q star? You have finite sample. So finite round results as well. No, so that's my question. Like, if I uh, don't know the no Q star, rarely, so yeah, yeah, you will. So you don't know Q star. This is yeah. a trial and error. Yeah. So uh, means how how can I uh, come to know that uh, my Q is now stable, or uh, I don't need to do further iteration? Right. So algorithmically, you just have to check whether Q T plus one is uh, close to Q T. So if this matrix has not changed too much, okay. So the values you're describing are stable at mm -hmm. each state action pair, then you kind of terminate. Uh, so now, so the reason why I introduced Q-learning was because we're going to uh, kind of jump <laughs> quite a few levels. So first level is uh, function approximation. So instead of storing this S times A numbers, let's say we have uh, S states and A actions at every state 
then we have s times a numbers. Uh, instead of storing so many numbers, uh, maybe you can reduce the dimensionality. Uh, and so we kind of represent q using a, using a function approximator uh, with parameters w. And so hopefully q star of sa is, is well approximated by uh, this, uh, this low dimensional function approximator. So these pictures are representing what I just said. Uh, so instead of having uh, uh, a state times action numbers, you have this parameter w. I just show two different uh, versions because in one version, action is an input and uh, both state and action are as input and you just get a scalar value. In the second version, state is an input and you get the whole vector of the different scores. You get the whole row of, of that table, basically. Um, and so, on this function approximator, you can have many different types, linear function approximator, addition tree, a neural network, you can have basis functions, nearest neighbor based approximators, and so on. Uh, and so, the reason I introduced that is, uh, uh, we'll see that uh, deep learning based approximators are also used. So what is uh, deep reinforcement learning? So we use a, a deep network to represent uh, this value function, for example. But also note that we can also represent some other objects. The two other objects I was talking about, a policy and uh, the model itself. You can, you can actually approximate the policy and the model as well using function approximators. And in this case, you can also use uh, deep networks to approximate these other objects. But let's focus on approximating the value function. Okay. Uh, and once you have uh, this function approximator, it's a network, you need to optimize or basically set the weights of the, this network, the W, so that it's kind of as a good approximator to uh, Q star, actually. And so you can uh, use uh, SCD based methods and uh, we'll uh, get to that in a couple of slides. So why deep representations? I will not <laughs> go into the detail, but they are, uh, for example, if it's an image recognition task, you kind of see the progress uh, from 2010 to 2014 uh, on the ImageNet uh, image recognition task, the performance is, uh, or the error rate is only 7%, or maybe actually now it's lesser. Uh, in for this, uh, uh, so is this, oh, so this is image detection task. Um, so the earlier uh, way of detecting uh, detecting objects in images, you know, was, uh, uh, I guess Kritika can tell <laughs> much better, but so basically you had to hand engineer some features, uh, like uh, HOG features or something like that, and then use a shallow uh, uh, machine learning method, uh, like SPM, to actually classify. Uh, or even detect objects uh, in images. Uh, now you have basically the input is going to be uh, uh, raw image pixels, and you have a deep network with a lot of a lot of with the network layers kind of representing convolution or pooling operations. And then maybe towards the end you'll have fully connected networks and uh, fully connected layers. And uh, and so this this deep uh, pipeline can directly work with raw image pixels without you kind of hand engineering. Of course, you need to uh, have a lot of data to fine tune the parameters of this network. Uh, so so we look at uh, value function approximation. Uh, so recall that the uh, Q-learning update was uh, as, as shown in the first line. Uh, so at optimality, of course, at optimality, we know that there should not be any uh, update. In the sense, the second term should be 0. It's a fixed point, right? Uh, um, so the second term uh, should be zero. So what we can do is we can minimize the empirical error between uh, the the first term, so this term and the, this term, okay? And because now I've added uh, uh, the parameters of the approximator here. Uh, so let's say, uh, so let's say, uh, so so we want to. Uh, change w, let's say at, at some round, at some round t, I want to change w such that the distance between, or the difference between these two numbers is small. Uh, so this optimization, so w is going to be a, let's say, million dimensional uh, parameter vector, then this is a nonlinear optimization, uh, uh, typically, uh, because first of all, the uh, function approximator is nonlinear. Uh, and so there are a couple of issues while kind of updating this w to make these numbers closer and closer together. If you make this number, uh, this difference closer and closer together, you are kind of approaching the fixed point of that uh, update equation. And so uh, naive optimization diverges for, for this nonlinear uh, optimization because data is not IID, and so uh, data is not IID, and, and policy is too sensitive. So the max over actions can uh, completely change the uh, future tra trajectory. 
So there are a couple of issues with uh, naively using a deep network uh, as a function approximator. Uh, and so what uh, uh, what was proposed back in I guess 2012 was uh, uh, basically the same thing. You uh, approximate the Q function using a uh, using a Q network, which is the deep network, where you kind of uh, introduce two uh, I guess engineering tricks. Uh, to deal with uh, the issue that data is not IID and uh, there is some uh, instability in these uh, updates, as in uh, things diverge or oscillate and so on. So, so for the IID issue, you uh, store uh, historical, historically seen states, actions, uh, uh, rewards um, uh, in, in a replay memory D, and then you sample the subset of these triples uh, from the memory, and then optimize the mean square error between this term and this term, which is what we wanted to do in every round, we can just do a batch uh, update of W uh, such that the difference between these two is minimized. Okay, um, and then uh, to minimize, uh, so the to get rid of the issue of oscillations or divergence, you we, we can also freeze the target network. So let's ignore that W is a parameter here, and so we only have to optimize for W on uh, on the second term. So we can freeze uh, this target. So this is called a target. This is this is the, uh, you, you want to change W such that this number is close to this target, basically. You can do that by basically least squares. So you have a least squares objective and you can think of uh, uh, changing W. And since W is the parameter of a deep network, you want to use uh, SGD style updates to do so. Just What's the problem that's being solved with experience so they observe that the deeper networks uh, naive optimization diverges and oscillates because of uh, because uh, you're doing an update. So from let's say round t, you can change w. Uh, you change you get the new data, uh, which is this r t plus one. You change w in the next round. Uh, the new data, the next data that you observe, s t plus one, r t r t plus two. Uh, that data is kind of correlated with this highly. So that doesn't help in learning the w well. So the they fix with. I mean, actually, experience replay was uh, proposed many years before uh, uh, DeepMind's uh, uh, algorithm DQN. But you don't use the immediate uh, observation. Yeah, you use uh, you kind of batch and kind of subsample uh, observation of your history, and hopefully that's because it's subsampling, uh, or potentially uniformly at random, that data is not correlated. So these are some engineering things. Uh, <laughs> Done to uh, get a good uh, uh, RL agent based on a deep uh, function approximator. Okay. So I guess we don't need to go into the details of the architecture. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> but uh, uh, so so with that agent, with that function approximator, they were able to play many many games in this uh, uh, environment called the Atari learning environment. Um, and uh, the key thing is uh, they used uh, the specific function approximator they used was. Basically, just a CNN. Uh, I think uh, many people already know what <laughs> CNN does. Uh, basically, it's uh, reducing the dimensionality of the lower layers by uh, uh, by assuming uh, uh, certain symmetries in the data uh, in, in the in the images. So basically, you're basically weight sharing. Instead of think of a fully connected layer where you have a W matrix with all uh, elements being separate, instead of that, you have uh, elements uh, tied together. So. Uh, and there is another layer called pooling, which just minimizes uh, the dimensionality of uh, your images. Kind of takes care, adds robustness to your intermediate layers activations. Anyway, so CNN was what they used, and they showed uh, better. So the agent was able to do better than a human. Uh, human in in playing these games in terms of achieving scores. Uh, so breakout that we saw uh, earlier, uh, where you had to clear the bricks and get scores. So I guess that is also somewhere over here. Okay, so we're here, um, third one from from the left. So basically, they show that an RL agent through trial and error, of course, through trial and error is not accounted for. <laughs> uh, it takes many days to at least. Uh, uh, it takes many days to uh, uh, train this this agent, but once trained, it can uh, play breakout better than an average human, and that's what is shown here. Uh, what is this breakout? Uh, so actually, it's a linear linear learner. So instead of a deep 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 function approximator, you have a shallow function approximator, which is a linear function approximator. Uh, 
Uh, so CNN was just used to approximate that Q function. Why do you want, I mean, so you need to reason about why um, an RNN would be a function approximator, first of all. CNN is uh, useful because it actually reduces your dimension. No, no, no. So here, as I said, uh, if you look at the breakout example, the screenshots were the inputs. Okay. So, so because it's a screenshot, it has all the image related symmetries that you can exploit, which is what CNNs exploit in ImageNet tasks and so on. And so that's why they use CNN based function approximator. Uh, but you may want to reason something like that if you want to change the function approximator. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, value function approximation is not the only thing. There are other function approximators that you can use. You can directly approximate the policies, uh, policy functions. Uh, and so I guess this is just a snapshot of some of the other tasks which I've been doing, which people have been working on uh, very recently. Uh, so policy and value function approximation was used in something called uh, the AlphaGo agent, which was used to play uh, against uh, uh, Lee Sedol, um, who was a uh, Go player, um, I guess the top Go player, uh, and beat him. Uh, this was very publicized back in March 2016. Um, so, so it uses, so whatever agent that they built, they, they kind of use build as building blocks these policy function approximators and value function approximators, both. Uh, the note that there are slight differences. This is a game, so it's not stochastic. It is basically uh, what you you interact with the environment. Environment includes another a another agent or another player who kind of uh, is trying to uh, beat you. So there are some variations. But what uh, actually is uh, some of the same features of the feed feet are basically that there are too many states. So, so you, you can't, uh, even, even though it's a deterministic, so, so let's say the positions of your position, your opponent positions are the state of the game. Uh, uh, you're not able to, uh, and since every, you know everything, there is no stochasticity, uh, you know what actions you take and uh, what are valid actions, uh, you can kind of play the game to the end and kind of see whether that position was a good position to be in and that action was a good, good action to take. It's just too difficult to evaluate all that. So to compress, to do that, uh, evaluation of positions and kind of roll forward the uh, game to the end and kind of see what is the value of that state and taking an action, putting a, I guess, how many of you are aware of the Go game at all? Okay, so it's just like chess, so just think of you have a board game, you're you're moving uh, uh, objects uh, onto the board and placing the objects at different positions again. Okay. Uh, that's that's uh, kind of beside the point. What I'm saying is that uh, if you are if you have a board game uh, and it, and it has too many states, let's say you're in some position, okay, some position of your pawns and some position of the other person's pawns, just to uh, kind of see what is the value of that state or just to see the value of that state and taking a particular action is very difficult to do uh, if there are so many states. <laughs> uh, so. That's why you want to do that in an approximate manner. That's where we are actually using the uh, policy approximator and the uh, value function approximator. So the value function approximator, we, since we just described it in a little bit more detail, is basically given the position, it kind of evaluates uh, what is the value of being in this position, V of S, remember. Or, v, or Q of S comma I is just uh, the position plus what you want to do, there will be a number which will tell you how good, your, how good that state comma action pair is. Can the rules learned by this system be used to teach human beings to become better Go players? Yeah, I think after after the uh, defeat of uh, the number one player, they are using they are trying to learn patterns of uh, how AlphaGo is uh, plays different strategies at different uh, points of the game uh, to train themselves. Uh, that they are doing. Yeah. So they are, Actually, this they this. Are interpretable in that sense. No, no, no. I mean, they are just uh, so interpretability in deep networks is <laughs> yeah, and exactly. uh, functions of deep networks is uh, is an interesting area. I don't think uh, they are looking at, uh, for example, the parameters of these networks to figure out what's no, what no, is no, doing. But if they can somehow unearth those patterns to teach other human beings, it is in some sense. Uh -huh, so the patterns are observables, right? So in certain states, what actions did it take, or in certain okay. sequence of states, what actions did it take? Mm -hmm. So that is observable because you can just run this agent against itself, look at a lot of self-plays and kind of see how it played and how it won, uh, things like that. Um, so so in games what happens is you, you do something called research, you're in a certain state, you try out what, what all can happen in the future and for that 
to do that research efficiently, they are using these uh, uh, function approximators. So it's a slight variant, but I just included that because we just looked at value function approximator, so it's relevant to that. Uh, so the question is, are we done? You know, we uh, so uh, we could beat the best uh, uh, chess player 15 years ago, or uh, yeah, close to 20 years ago. We beat the best uh, Go player uh, earlier this year. So are we done? Um, the interesting thing is, yes, large scale data does lead to very good uh, prediction models. Uh, these function approximators can very well approximate uh, the latent or unknown uh, Q star functions. Uh, and we saw that they are being used in Atari and other RL algorithms. Uh, but the missing piece is this uh, efficient exploration for data collection. So that's still uh, something that has not been completely solved. Uh, if you remember the Q learning algorithm, uh, there was this uh, 1 minus epsilon take a random action with, sorry, epsilon take a random action with 1 minus epsilon take a, uh, uh, you know, best action using information so far. Uh, is that is that the is that a solid, is that the best you can do or you can do better? Uh, how many minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so let's look at inefficiency in a particular task, which is called the reverse wing task. So let me just uh, explain what this uh, what this environment is. This is just a good to recap uh, the notion of environment uh, in the RL task. So let's say there are six states. Okay, so. Uh, This is left for you guys. Yeah. yeah. So left. So let's. Uh, so this is left, and that's right. Uh, and uh, and let's say you're in any state. Let's say you're in state S3. There are two actions you can take in any state. Okay. So so every state has legal actions too. And uh, in each state, if you take a, if you take an action uh, which is uh, left, you can you, you go to the state which is uh, towards its left with probability one. So this dotted lines represent. Uh, the state transitions which happen if you take an action uh, A. In this case, if you take left with probability one, you're going to the going to going the left side. Okay, and if you take an action right, that's a little bit complicated. So let's pick this piece. If you if you take an action right, you only go forward with probability 0.35. You stay in the same state with probability 0.6, and you go back with probability 0.05. That's the ground truth of this environment. But you of course don't know that this is. <laughs> Transition probability of staying in the same state, this is the transition probability of going forward, this is the probability of going backward. You don't know these numbers, basically. You know that there are six states, um, and uh, and there are, there are no rewards in, in states S2 to S5. There are, there are rewards uh, attached to being in uh, state uh, S1. Uh, here it's uh, uh, 5 by 1000, and there it's 1. Some, some huge difference between uh, the two rewards on the left and the right. Okay. So, so that's the uh, environment. Uh, these numbers are not known. You are an RL agent. You have to uh, you have to figure out uh, what actions to take in different states and uh, collect rewards. Total collect total you know expected total rewards should be maximized. And uh, uh, so, what is the best strategy here? Yeah. yeah. So for every state, think of the policy pi of s. So pi of s one right. Pi of s two uh, right. That's, that's the optimal policy, uh, but you need to learn that policy, right? The RL agent has to figure that out. Uh, um, so what is, what is seen is that Q learning takes uh, an exponential number of <laughs> exponential number of time, uh, rounds or uh, needs a lot of times uh, a lot of number of time steps to figure out this optimal policy of going going towards uh, right always because they are randomly exploring. Um, and so, for example, uh, for it to go all the way to the uh, right, it's a product of all these probabilities, right? So, which is very low. So, question is, can we do better? Um, and so, so that's where we have also done some some work, uh, which I'm going to describe now. So, so for that, I'm going to uh, just define uh, uh, define a more challenging objective, which is going to be. Uh, so initially, I had said uh, the agent wants to maximize expected total reward, expected uh, uh, total uh, reward that it collects. Let's say it, uh, I just change the object a little bit. I want to uh, maximize the uh, ex uh, average reward, okay? Uh, expected average reward into the into the future. So uh, same thing, but uh, but there's some normalization, and uh, and so I can ascribe to any policy uh, starting from state S a number. Row, which tells me uh, how good is this policy from uh, this state uh, in terms of this number, rather than expected total reward. Okay, that's that's a mild change here, and 
I'm gonna define what is called regret. So this is gonna be a more challenging objective, which uh, which is gonna be uh, if I can ascribe such a number. Let's say I fix the starting state to be some let's say S3 in the previous previous uh, reverse swim task. I look at all policies. I know always right is the best policy. So I'm gonna evaluate this number for that, uh, and I multiply which let's say I I I have let's say a budget of uh, 100 rounds. So I I'll get some number here. And I'm just going to compare my agent's uh, performance as if the agent took a bunch of actions according to some policies, uh, okay, it will get a bunch of rewards. So T at T1, uh, at, sorry, T plus two will get a reward and then uh, and so on. I'm just going to uh, uh, take expectation, but uh, that's just for uh, analysis. Uh, so I'm going to compute the performance of uh, the agent as the difference between what you could have done uh, if you knew the optimal policy versus what did you do in, in, those, in those T rounds, basically. Okay, uh, with this challenging, uh, it's a little bit more challenging objective than previously being asymptotically, you know, converging to Q star and so on. Uh, now, so there are algorithms that use clever exploration exploitation strategies to optimize this objective and there are a couple of algorithms called UCRL and PSRL, okay. Uh, so these are based on a couple of well-known ideas in uh, uh, bandit uh, literature, uh, the idea of upper confidence bounds and the idea of Thompson sampling. Uh, so anyway, there are a couple of uh, algorithms called UCRL and PSRL, and these algorithms are able to do really well on the reverse swim task. So what do you mean by doing really well? So let's think of our time elapsed. Uh, sorry, the numbers are not visible, so, but this is some huge number, 10 to the power 5 or 10 to the power 6. Uh, this is regret. So so what you ideally want is uh, very low values of regret. Okay. So these these uh, bunch of red trajectories are for PSRL algorithm. And these bunch of blue trajectories are for the UCRL algorithm. What it's trying to show is that in in a, in, in a finite amount of time, uh, you are actually doing as good as uh, uh, the best policy, which is always right in in that reverse swim task. Note that I'm, I'm, we have not even plotted uh, Q learning because Q learning will have a regret which is going to be outside this, outside this, uh, you know, range on the y-axis. So, so that's that's. So in the reverse swim task, Q learning does bad. You kind of improve the exploration exploitation strategy, and we can do somewhat better. And that's what people have done. So can we do even? Can we do better than these UCL and PSR if we are given if we are given more information about the problem? So UCR and PSR are not using any information about the problem, okay? But still, they are able to kind of uh, do well in terms of the regret objective. Uh, but what if we had a little bit more information about the problem? Can we do even better than UCR and PSR? Okay, and the answer is yes. Uh, we can beat UCR and PSR if there is some structure in this problem. And so I'm going to describe uh, some work that we did uh, here. Uh, so so we so which use a structure. So what is meant by structure? So let's consider a very very simple another environment, which is which we call the which I call the slow server environment. Here the problem is to uh, minimize the main number of customers waiting to be serviced. So just think of it as uh, the inverse of a maximizing the reward type of uh, uh, objective. Uh, it has various applications, uh, you know, call center operations and so on. So what is the environment? People are entering into a queue. You at the you are sitting at the top of the queue, and you have to direct people to either go to server one or server two. And server one has a service rate uh, new one. The server two has a service rate new two, and new two, let's say, is less than new one without Gaussian generality. Uh, so your actions are just direct people, but your your actions, of course, are going to influence the main number of customers waiting to be serviced. So let's say this is a slower server. You kind of direct everybody over there. Of course, your queue length is going to increase, right? So so there is some non-triviality that you want to you want to do here, and so so the policy. Uh, um, so the question is when should you use the slow server or when should you use basically those servers? And the structure in this problem is that you should always use the faster server, let's say new one, and use the slower server only when the queue length exceeds a certain threshold. So that's the structure in this problem. That, uh, that is there. Uh, you can kind of uh, prove that such a, such, a, uh, such a property exists for the optimal policy. In the sense, uh, the optimal policy is going to direct everybody to new one. And once the queue length exceeds some threshold n, it starts it's, it starts using uh, server queue. So that's the uh, property that you can prove for the optimal policy without knowing the optimal policy. As in, of course, the optimal policy is characterized by this threshold. But even you don't need to know the threshold to tell that this is going to be a property of the optimal policy. It was proved long time ago. 
Uh, so, given the so, structure. Uh, Peter, just to clarify, it means that you will keep the flow server idling, right? Yes. Even if, if you are within the threshold, yeah. the fast server is busy, you will still keep customers waiting. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's not, it's, a, it's not a non-idling policy, right? Uh, what do you mean non-idling? So it is going to keep the server to idle non up to some threshold. Then you never wait with Ah, okay, okay, yeah, it's not a non-idling policy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're correct. policy is an idling, it's a policy that uh, does keep uh, some resources idle. Yes. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. And uh, of course, finding the structure was not easy. Uh, but if you know the structure of the optimal policy, uh, so basically I'm saying that the optimal policy satisfies this property, then you should use that property to kind of learn uh, uh, optimal policies faster, you know, uh, change your exploration, exploitation strategy, basically. Another environment is a very, uh, I guess, a textbook, a textbook example where basically you want to minimize the average cost of running a machine. So let's say the machine has just three states, but in general it can have many states, let's say the printer. Uh, first day it's, it's in good state but it, in, in different rounds it kind of deteriorates with some randomness uh, to either bad states or ugly states. Uh, at any given state you can call the repairman and kind of set it back to uh, the original extremely good state but there's a cost associated with uh, uh, calling the repairman so you want to minimize uh, the, uh, the un, uh, you want to minimize the cost of running, uh, running, running a machine indefinitely basically. Uh, and so, so when should we perform the maintenance? Again, uh, this has a similar structure to the previous problem. You only replace the machine when uh, the badness exceeds a certain threshold. Okay, and badness is measurable here. Of course, in realistic settings, you can you may not have full view about the state of the machine. Uh, so uh, there is some caveat there. So so given these structures, um, so so what, so there are other examples. Uh, for example, optimal, optimal policies are linear for LQR problems under certain assumptions uh, in control theory. Um, there are other policies in communication queuing systems that, that also have threshold uh, structure. Uh, there are policies in inventory control which are multi-threshold structure. So, uh, actually even in, uh, so there are many textbooks examples. Uh, so and uh, our hypothesis is that one can do better uh, than these general purpose methods when there is structure. Okay, and. Uh, and so what we propose is a family of algorithms which kind of modify or are variants of some well-known algorithms uh, to exploit uh, this additional information. Um, and uh, they are based on similar principles uh, which I said upper confidence bounds and Thompson sampling which are well-known uh, I guess uh, uh, basis for building uh, bandit algorithms. And uh, there's a minor uh, uh, improvement which is that we use uh, some renewal reward properties under the hood to port those bandit algorithms in the RL setting. So I'm going to discuss that uh, uh, right now. So uh, so first of all, note that the number of policies in, M in an MDP is exponential. Uh, in an RL task, uh, if you have A actions in every state and you have S states, then this, this is the number of functions you can have, that pile of S functions. Uh, so the, the structural properties on the optimal policy basically reduce the set, right? Reduce the size of the set. Uh, hopefully, if it reduces the size of the set to something polynomial in the relevant parameters, which is uh, the number of states and the number of actions, then you may be in a good shape. And uh, and maybe sometimes the policy space reduction does not translate uh, well to the reduction in uh, transition reward uh, function space, which is what UCRL and PSRL do. So, so as I said, uh, if you remember at the beginning I was saying agents maintain certain representations. Either they maintain representations of policies, they maintain representations of value functions, or they maintain representations of the environment itself, like reward and transition functions. So what I'm saying is that UCRL and PSRL maintain representations of uh, uh, the uh, model itself, like transition functions and the reward functions. So we are trying to come up with an algorithm which maintains representations uh, on the policies itself. Of course, if there are too many policies, I cannot have you know, exponential number of scores or numbers that I can associate with each policy. So hopefully this additional property kind of reduces uh, the number of policies that I need to effectively look at. Okay. And, uh, and so let's assume that I only have uh, uh, k policies, okay, pi 1 to pi, pi k, and uh, just recall that rho is this number, which is basically a score I associate with, I associate with each policy, right, uh, which is a uh, variant of uh, instead of expected total reward, I'm just doing a different uh, uh, objective here. Okay, so 
So what I am actually, actually want to do is I want to consider these policies as arms of a multi-armed bandit, okay? Um, and uh, and so if the state action reward sequences uh, can be used to obtain empirical estimates of rho, rho pi of i, so since uh, there are k arms which are policies, then we can apply binary algorithms uh, such as UCB1 and Thomson sampling. So so I have policies as arms. If I if I kind of choose a policy and I execute it for some time. I see a bunch of states, actions, uh, rewards, next states, uh, those tuples, right? So, I mean, that sequence of numbers. So, if I can use those numbers to kind of estimate rho, then that's the score attached with each of the arm or basically each of the policy, and I can figure out which arm uh, or which policy is the best uh, as soon as, you know, in a sample efficient way, okay? So, basically, the question boils down to how to obtain an estimate of uh, this, of, of rho, which is a number that you want to attach to each policy. Okay, um, so to estimate this row, uh, so what we're gonna use is uh, basically a simple uh, observation that under a given policy, uh, the return times to a fixed, uh, fixed state are renewal times, which transforms the MDP into a renewal reward process. So let's uh, understand the statement. If you fix a policy, an MDP is just a Markov chain, right? It's basically saying, a fixed policy means you know you have a mapping from state to action, so you basically you just follow that action, and so that uh, basically you, you, the only interesting dynamics are the sequence of states, which is what a uh, Markov chain is. Uh, you, if you're in state ST, you just go to ST plus one because you're following the deterministic policy. You know you're following that policy. Okay, so what I'm saying is that uh, now we have attached rewards to states, right? Given a state and action, there's a reward as well. So if I uh, so you know, if you attach rewards to a Markov chain, it's going to be become a, a mark, uh, it's going to become a reward process, okay? And what I'm saying is, if I fix a state uh, and and think of return times to that to that state, uh, I'll have a renewal reward process, okay? Um, so maybe we'll skip the second point. What what is the po what is the uh, 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 what is the uh, use of this observation? Is that I can estimate that row of Rho of pi, which actually has a form which is the left hand side of uh, uh, this renewal reward theorem, uh, using uh, other, some other estimators, which I can probably estimate using the sequences that I observe states, next states, action, uh, state, action, next state, and reward uh, sequences that I observe. Okay? Uh, basically, my difficulty was I, I don't know how to kind of estimate rho of pi i, uh, which, uh, which is the number I want to associate with each policy in, in my, uh, in, uh, in uh, associate a number to each of my policies, I can associate those numbers using uh, a couple of other estimators is what I'm trying to get at. Okay, um, so so let's actually look at an example. Uh, so so let's say uh, I fix the state as uh, S1, and uh, since I fix the policy, I'll go through, navigate through a bunch of uh, states, and hopefully at some point of time, I get back to S1, okay, uh, at some time T1. And similarly, maybe in some other, uh, Maybe ST1 is uh, S1 again, and then again I uh, kind of navigate through a bunch of states and come back to uh, ST2, uh, come back to state, the green state at S, uh, at T2, okay? So given this, this observation, the string of observations, which means the sequence of states and the sequence of rewards, because I fixed a pol policy, I know what actions I'm taking. Uh, given this, this sequence of two observations, I can actually compute rho hat. That's the bottom line here. Uh, where uh, rho hat is a ratio of two numbers, two estimators actually, A and B, where A is, uh, uh, a is a sum of uh, uh, rewards, uh, um, A is basically the sum of these two rewards, and B is the length of these uh, uh, renewal uh, times, basically. These are random variables because you, you don't know how long, after what time you're gonna come back to the same state. So, so that's all uh, there is to this trick. Basically the trick is to estimate rho, which is a number that you want to attach to policies, which are arms of a bandit. Okay? So, so once I can estimate this rho, uh, now I can maintain uh, different types of, uh, you know, I can use uh, basic uh, bandit theory-based uh, techniques like uh, UCB or Thomson, uh, or you know, basically a combination of the above two to come up with uh, algorithms for uh, reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, so let's focus on the UCB version of it. So I just told you how to estimate rows, as in I can always keep a uh, estimate of uh, the row of pi i, which is a score of that policy. 
So, uh, so let's focus on the UCB. One observation, sorry. Yeah. You're going in a good Very fast, so definitely no, no, ask questions. I, mean, I, mean, I think it's good. <laughs> yeah. So you talked about uh, renewal thing, like going back to a uh, state, right? Yeah. Uh, is this in some way similar to one of the approaches you mentioned before to handle IAD of keeping memory oh, staff, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you're trying to learn and remember, right? You know, yeah, yeah, so here we are remembering only summary statistics, right? A and oh, B okay. is enough. So there the problem is in a deep network, uh, if you if you do a gradient update at, after receiving every reward, uh, that gradient update is not able to converge. You are basically oscillating. So you remember the whole? So you remember this whole point. string and then you subsample some state reward pairs okay. and use that as uh, you know data for your regression to kind of update your weight. So that's uh, that was for deep uh, Q, learn, Q learning agent. Uh, can this problem also be thought of? I mean, you can think of those structures as your prior probability on the yes. policy space. So yes, yes, yes. It be a Bayesian kind of learning, right? You are updating. Uh, you start with the prior. Yes, yes, yes. It is, it is a prior, right? So, so basically, policy space. So basically, if I, if I constrain all policies that I want to look at to have a certain structure, that structure or the structure policy, then it will reduce the policy space, but it's not guaranteed to translate into some some nice constraints on the uh, some other objects uh, relevant here which is the translation probabilities and the rewards so psrl and ucrl so for example let's pick psrl it's a it's a complete algorithm right so that algorithm maintains a, a distribution on on the transition reward probabilities so once you have additional prior information you can kind of use that as a distribution and so uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, so if, if the policy space reduction, if this property could be translated into some constraints on the transition and reward probabilities, you could add that into your add that into your constraint, uh, sorry, add that into your prior for the PSR algorithm. You can do that. But this translation is dependent on each uh, 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 each problem, each uh, task. So, right? uh, so are the policies arms of the bandit? Yeah, in our setting, they are arms of the bandit. So we, that's why we want it to be polynomial or <laughs> some small number. Okay. And yeah. uh, after revisiting a state, you can actually use another policy. I mean, like renewal is your reset or trying. Yes, policy. yes, precisely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not gonna. So there's a if policies are arms. When I'm gonna change the policies? I'm not gonna change the policy every time I take an action. Like in a basic planet problem, you uh, you try an try an arm, you get some reward. You can try some other arm, you get a reward. Since arms are policies in my case, I can't just. Uh, uh, try an arm in, in T and then try a policy in T and then another policy uh, pi prime in uh, T plus 1. I have to keep that policy P until uh, this renewal happens. No, but uh, as in if you stop in running, let's say at the orange state, why not uh, would you get an estimate for the uh, goodness of your policy? Yeah, so the, so the estimators will not converge. So, so if I do renewal, then I know that these estimate, this row hat converges to uh, row pi. I mean, if you st stop in between, uh, what is the estimator? You need to define that estimator and then show that it converges asymptotically as well as you know some finite time, finite time convergence. You so want that's the property that you proved before. And yeah, yeah. If, since I map it to a renewal reward type of process, I know that uh, these estimators will converge. So I think I kind of skipped that point. So so this a by b in that situation, while well, these estimators, each one converges to uh, this expectation, this expectation. So it will converge to this, and this is the same as pi, which I did not uh, explain in detail. Mm -hmm. It's also a cycle in MDP or something. Cycle? Revisit, actually. Yeah, I need to revisit. I need to revisit the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, so one meta comment is that we, we went to Q learning, uh, DQN, and then AlphaGo. They were really, really large scale MDPs. Then we said, is the, is the exploration, exploration uh, problem solved? We said it's open. And then we kind of scaled down to a very simple six state MDP to show that. Uh, Q-learning doesn't work well in that six-state MDP, the reverse frame MDP, and then we are looking at really small cell MDP. So this is somewhat reasonable <laughs> in that setting. Uh, so there we are trying to answer the question: Can we do better in terms of exploration exploitation? Can we do better? Can we do exploration better than doing uh, this? What Q-learning does, you know, epsilon with epsilon probability do random action with one minus epsilon probability do best action I so mean, far. Policy is always an uh, uh, yeah. for this, right? I, I mean, people do functional programming for policies also. Yes, yes, yes. You can do. Uh, yeah, you can have. You can maintain a parameter uh, for policies. That's what I said, right? Initially, there were three types of objects you could keep with you: model, uh, value functions, or the policies themselves. You can approximate. You can come up with functional approximators for 
values, uh, models, as well as uh, policies as well. And I think I had a slide on policy uh, function approximators some uh, uh, results, right? But we are not going to use uh, function approximators here. We are working at the level of just maintaining numbers, uh, which are scores for policies, just like we are maintaining numbers, which are scores for being in that state. Yeah. Uh, do we do, uh, need to do this expect, uh, theory for all the policies? Like yes. Yes, all, all the K policies, yes. Uh, so we have K policies which satisfy that uh, structure constraint, uh, which hopefully K is not a uh, exponential number that, which is, for example, a to the power s. It's hopefully a polynomial in a and s, which is the number of states and number of actions. Sorry, number of actions and number of states. Yeah. And uh, how do we ensure like uh, the renewal actually happens? Like if you play chess or something. Yeah, it's indefinite. <laughs> so yeah, we cannot control when when renewal happens. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's trial and error, right? In real life, also you can have like cases where like you never return to that point. Yes, yes. yes. How 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 do we work with? Cases. Then, I mean, in terms of algorithms, you can always terminate in between, but we cannot guarantee that uh, those estimators are unbiased estimators and they converge to the scores on the policies, right? In terms of in terms of practice, you can always terminate uh, after some threshold uh, number of rounds that okay, you haven't re revisited the state, just threshold and what have you observed, you can use as a, use that as a proxy for scoring that policy, but it's you will not have uh, performance guarantees. Yeah, it's a limitation of this uh, approach, as you rightly point out. Um, okay, uh, where were we? I was just going to describe UCB uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, how many of you have heard of the UCB algorithm for the uh, bandits problem? Some of you. So, so let's uh, you know kind of uh, uh, take the tangent and look at just a bandit problem. So, what is uh, uh, a bandit problem? Let's say we have uh, k coins, which think of them as k arms, uh, with biases uh, p1, p2, to pk, okay, which are unknown. So, okay, and we want to maximize the uh, number of uh, heads in our t trial. So t is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is given to us, and we want to maximize the number of heads. Since we don't know anything at the beginning, uh, you can think of okay. Um, uh, Okay, let's also kind of set up some more notation. And so at time t, which is smaller than capital T, we try and arm at, which just means we're going to flip a particular coin, uh, one of these k coins, and get reward rt, which is, which is if it is heads, we get one point. If it's tails, we don't get any point. Okay, and the instantaneous regret is in uh, at round t. Let's say I flip the coin. Let's say one of the k, small k. Let's say I'll get a reward. Uh, I'll get a reward, but its expected reward is going to be just the bias of the coin. Okay. And my instantaneous regret is going to be what is the best coin that I should have been playing from the start minus the bias of the coin that I actually played in that round D. Okay, that's the instantaneous regret. I can just sum this over and talk about cumulative regret. Okay. Uh, now it's the same issue as before. Since we don't know all these biases of the coin, some some of the time I need to spend in figuring out the biases of the coin, and some of the time I need to uh, spend time on trying to uh, use the coin which I think is the best coin. So best coin uh, as of now, so as to exploit the information that I know and maximize uh, what I need to do, which is like a, a number of heads, okay? Uh, and the UCB algorithm follows what is called the optimism in the face of uncertainty uh, principle. Uh, so, so what does it do? So the algorithm maintains confidence bounds on estimates. So, so in this case, it's very simple. So let's say I tried coin one five times, and three times it landed head. So I at least have an estimator for uh, the true uh, bias of that coin, which is just 3 by 5, right? Uh, that's uh, fine. So it's 3 by 5. But uh, so similarly, I can maintain estimates for all the all the all the k arms. So whatever number of times I tried that arm and the number of times I got heads, using that ratio, I can have by, I can have estimators. So what UCB is going to do is add some additional element to make it more. So when I said I, I have these biases, I haven't told you how I am trying out these uh, trying out these uh, arms, right? So what I need to specify is an exploration exploitation strategy. So for that, I'm going to define uh, an additional number which I'm going to attach to each arm, which is going to be uh, uh, which is going to be the estimate uh, that I know so far plus some additional uh, term, which is going to be logarithmic in square root of the logarithmic in terms of the number of rounds that have elapsed so far, and the number of, and inversely proportional to the number of times I've tried this arm. So, so what is it intuitively doing? I'm trying to, uh, if I haven't tried this arm uh, or, or this coin uh, many times, then I should, then this number is going to be large. Uh, 
uh, compared to others. And uh, if I have tried this uh, uh, coin many, many times, then the denominator is going to be large, and so this whole term is going to be a small number. So it's somehow changing, uh, uh, it's somehow trying to make us, uh, you know, if I base my decisions out of, out of this number rather than this number, right? It's trying to change my decision in terms of trying out the coins, right? So that's, that's the intuition. And uh, uh, so instead of deciding based on just empirical estimates of how good a coin is, I'm gonna base my decision on how good my coin is plus this additional bonus stuff, which is inversely related to how many times I've tried that coin. And uh, if I try an arm based on these numbers, uh, it achieves a good upper bound on regret. Theoretically, you can show that uh, the regret is linear in the number of arms and logarithmic in the number of rounds in this stochastic setting. And it matches a particular lower bound as well, which means that you cannot do better than uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, asymptotics in terms of the number of rounds. And so that was the intuition for, uh, for UCB. So PUCB also maintains uh, uh, upper confidence bounds on the expected long run average reward. Remember, in our, in our setting, so this was just for coins, in our setting we had k policies and we, and we attached a number rho of pi i for each policy and we knew how to estimate rho hat of pi i, which is that estimator of the score for that policy. Just like in UCB, we are going to maintain additional bonuses for each of the policies, basically inversely related to the number of times I have tried that policy, uh, uh, so that I can kind of try policies which I have not tried uh, many times. Uh, and, uh, and and that's it. So that algorithm uh, with the new estimators uh, is gonna uh, base is based on the renewal reward statistic, and uh, so that's the algorithm which we're gonna use for figuring out the best policy in uh, uh, in the RL in an, in any given RL task. Okay. Um, so if we do that, uh, just the last couple of slides. If we do that, uh, then uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, we can see some performance uh, <laughs> uh, improvements, and I'm going to illustrate that using some empirical uh, data. So, so again, uh, it's a it's a plot with uh, time uh, uh, in on the x-axis and regret on the uh, y-axis. Uh, lower regret is better, and uh, I have plotted uh, the pre uh, the previously known algorithms PSRL and USRL their regrets. So PSRL is doing really well over here, and uh, uh, UCRL is doing Okay, I mean, relatively to PSRL, it's not doing that well, but it, it is a downward sloping. You know, it's it's kind of it's going to approach plateau data, uh, and that's a good uh, in, uh, that's a good sign. Now, our algorithms, uh, which are PUCV pluses and uh, P Thompson drops, uh, pluses is based on the same type of principle, which is upper confidence interval I was talking about, is similar to uh, UCRL. UCRL and, uh, and PU, P, PUCB are based on the optimism in the face of uncertainty principle, uh, which I just uh, discussed. And Thompson, uh, uh, P. Tom, P. Thompson, PSRL, based on uh, the Bayesian or Thompson sampling based uh, 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 idea. So they are um, so they are comparable here. Okay. Uh, so in this, uh, so this is a machine replacement task with uh, number of states being 100 and uh, this, this is the average performance on 10 Monte Carlo runs and, uh, and, and in this case actually warm PSRL does a little bit better in the first 100,000 rounds. So this is actually a really large uh, 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 x-axis uh, which is you might say that is unrealistic for real, real applications uh, but it just tells you the uh, importance of the uh, or the difficulty of the problem figuring out the exploration exploitation strategy uh, uh, when the number of states is just near 100. So so remember that alpha go at 10 to the power 270 states. Huh? And this uses that regular thing? Yes, yes, yes. So this PUCB, uh, so actually PUCB and Thompson both use uh, the renewal reward statistic and as they estimate. And what is the, sort of, you know, the, the rough uh, size of the, like the length of the... Return or whatever. Right? Oh, so for hundred states. Uh, okay, that's a good like question. A chain of that's what I. Yeah, it could be. It could be of the order of. Uh, it could be the order of the number of states actually. Uh, so I don't recollect now, uh, but that's a good question. So what is the ex average uh, renewal time? Uh, that could be of the order of number of states in this example, actually. We have a regret bound. Yeah, so the grid bound is not uh, is just the same as before because we just change the estimator and as long as the estimator co we have a um, convergence of the estimator rho hat to rho pi some finite sample 
uh, guarantee just like Hopkins bond mm -hmm. or something like that. Some concentration result, the same regret bound of the UCB just follows, for example, the PUC. Because if nothing has changed, right? Only the estimators have changed. As long as the estimators converge, uh, the algorithm converges. No, but the notion of regret also has changed, right? Yes, yes, but because uh, uh, it has changed, uh, but you can think of, uh, yes, it has changed, there are some slight differences, but uh, the previous uh, analysis just just goes through. Yeah. And same thing with uh, P. Thompson, but P. Thompson we did not do any analysis, but we are using the same estimators. Uh, um, okay, so the second experiment is, uh, uh, the slow server task I was talking about, where you just have to direct the uh, first person in the queue to either the slow server or the fast server. So this is some this is the arrival rate parameter of how quickly the customers are arriving, and these are parameters related to how quickly the servers can serve serve people. And I've assumed a maximum buffer length of 20, and number, number of states is 80 because it's uh, so number of people times uh, whether server one is busy or not, and whether server two is busy or not. Okay, and with 10 one color runs, you can see that. Uh, um, PUCB and P Thompson are, uh, is be is better in some in, in many of the time range uh, compared to PSR, which is this curve. So, of course, you can say that since we are using additional information about the structure of the uh, uh, optimal policy, which is that it's a threshold policy, and so we are now doing a search only on the restricted policy space. Uh, we are doing better. Of course, it's maintaining a different uh, different. Uh, uh, a representation. It's only maintaining. It's trying to reverse engineer the environment. So it's maintaining uh, ideas about uh, the transition properties and the rewards. So it's a different algorithm. So uh, both algorithms have decent. Both classes, both families of algorithms have decent regret. And again, Q learning is not going to even be in the scale. It's going to be a linearly increasing regret for a, for a long time. So so Q learning based exploration exploration strategy is quite naive. You really need some specialized exploration exploitation uh, methods to uh, do well in these small scale RL tasks. So, so basically, just to uh, uh, round up, so this PUC and P Thompson are simple and they need lesser random bits because we are uh, because of the way I have, uh, we are only looking at policy space and maintaining numbers on policies rather than states and actions. And uh, so, in terms of uh, regret guarantees. Uh, PUC and P Thompson are what are called uh, model-free algorithms, and uh, uh, UCR and PSR are what are called model-based algorithms. As I said, model-based just means you're maintaining uh, notions of uh, the dynamics of the environment, basically transition properties and rewards. Okay. Uh, compare these with uh, previously known algorithms like uh, asymptotic or finite time guarantees are known for Q-learning and some other algorithms, uh, like something called SARSA. And there are also model-based algorithms which also have asymptotic and uh, finite time algorithms, something called Rmax, E3, and so on. So these are the, uh, I guess, just the partitioning of which algorithms come of, come with uh, guarantees and which, uh, in, in, un, and what are the defining features. Uh, so, okay, so do we have time for connections or? <laughs> so, okay, just one slide, basically what, 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 what to do now? I mean, what is, uh, what are some of the open problems? So, uh, so the scalability is the biggest thing because of enormous success in deep learning. What are some scalable reinforcement learning algorithms? Of course, AlphaGo is one example. DeepQuin is one, one example. Uh, but that's by just one research group, so <laughs> can we do a lot more? Uh, um, and there have been quite a few papers uh, in the past couple of years to do so. Uh, sample efficiency, which is what we were trying to uh, uh, do, which is kind of uh, manage the exploration of your state action space better. Uh, and, uh, and there are other things like robustness, learning should not get stuck, uh, and learning from offline data, which is what is actually quite relevant to businesses where you've already, ex already deployed a policy and you've already observed something, but you want to learn from that policy uh, as much as possible in terms of future deployment of new policies and so on. Um, so you can also talk about generalization across states and tasks because there are symmetries involved or something like that. Uh, you may not observe fully uh, the relevant uh, part of what your action is uh, changing. For example, as I said, if I'm driving a car and, and let's say the agent press is accelerated to some value, and you only see, uh, instead of uh, seeing uh, uh, both x and y values of the next position, you only see x value. That is not, uh, uh, you know, that is just partial information. You may also want to deal with non Markov unity uh, uh, in an efficient way. And, uh, and theory and my deep reinforcement works, uh, as I said, because 
uh, we were looking at images in the case of Atari, and images have certain uh, invariances and certain property symmetries to be exploited, and that's why uh, that function approximator is doing well. So if you switch it with RNN, uh, it's not clear what's going to happen. Uh, and then uh, we still don't know how to work with uh, more complicated tasks and delayed rewards and so on. Um, so just la one last thing, uh, which is uh, in terms of scalability, people have looked at uh, uh, scaling up uh, 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 deep reinforcement learning using uh, a particular architecture where you have multiple agents interacting with multiple environments simultaneously and collecting that state action reward next state data and updating your parameters. So basically, they are embedding DQN, which is that uh, algorithm that we saw uh, some time ago, the DQN algorithm. They're embedding the DQN algorithm by uh, having many, many actors interact with the environment and many, many uh, uh, interact with the environment, collect the data, and, uh, and, and keep a common parameter across multiple machines. So I will not go into the detail of this particular uh, configuration, but uh, 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 so in this, actually what they did is, uh, so okay, I'll tell you what the result of doing this is. Okay, DQN of course can, uh, uh, you know, already know, we, we know that it, it does really good, uh, um, you know, playing of some of the games. We saw how it does for breakout. So here what they did is they had 100 actors or 100 agents, um, okay, 100 agents, and uh, there were 31 uh, such mach machines on the top left which were holding the parameters. Uh, and DQ, and if you remember, that actually took 14 hours to work on each game. So you saw that breakout game, right? So in terms of real wall clock time, it took 14, uh, sorry, 14 days to learn that um, that strategy of balancing the ball, such that the ball goes back and hits the bricks and so on. Uh, whereas this particular architecture, uh, with the same DQN idea, uh, solved the same, you know, learned an agent in uh, with with the same performance or better performance in six hours. So the improvement is uh, roughly uh, 30 times uh, speed up, okay, in terms of time, time required to learn an agent, good agent. But in terms of compute power, this one is taking 200 times more compute power than uh, just running a DQN on a, let's say, a one mach single machine GPU, so, uh, you know, GPU machine, okay. So 200x versus 30x speed up, uh, 200x more compute versus 30x speed up. So that's the, um, so, so that's the, uh, Direction scalability is an interesting direction. Uh, there are some resources that you can see. Sepp and Bato are some uh, famous scientists who have written a book on reinforcement learning. Uh, actually, this year they have released one, I think. Uh, there's also uh, David Silver, who's from DeepMind, who has a bunch of lectures uh, online, video lectures that you can go through. Uh, and there's, of course, uh, research. Uh, there's actually a GitHub page which has all the latest uh, research papers in. Uh, and deep reinforcement learning specifically, you know, policy-based approximators, value function-based approximators, uh, even model-based approximators, everything. And, uh, and the key papers are this, these two major papers, uh, Human Health Control of Deep Reinforcement Learning, which was the one which is talking about uh, playing Atari games really well, better than humans. This one was the one which is talking about mastering the game of Go with uh, deep neural networks and beating the world champion. And uh, this is our work. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, so in summary, uh, so so R is a great frame, framework to make intelligent agents. So this is the next thing that you want to do once you build really really good prediction models. Uh, you want to just specify goals and provide a feedback signals and uh, make the agent learn by trial and error. Uh, deep learning based R agents show promise in large complex tasks uh, uh, because the representations matter, just like we saw in the Atari environment. Uh, but efficient computation and system building is, is a challenge because of as I said, AlphaGo required a lot more machines, and I just showed you that you can have a 30x speed up in training uh, uh, by using a parallel architecture. Uh, and uh, this point, which is the efficient exploration exploitation, is still, uh, I would say, an open problem for even small small RL tasks, as in small MDPs. Uh, and so that's it. Thank you. Any questions at this point? Any remaining questions, actually? <laughs> okay. Hopefully, this gives you an idea of, uh, you know, we skipped a lot of details, but this gives you an idea of uh, basics of RL, what's the state of the art, and some research directions. Okay. Okay.
Okay, that's a reminder if Raga wants to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. So good. I think it was an excellent uh, intro to this. So if you want to know more, of course, you can catch. Um, one of the small agenda items, uh, or actually main agenda items, we want to discuss.